Welcome to the Jefferson County Schools Women's History Month Virtual Celebration Symposium. My name is Cadet Colonel Chloe Munslow. And my name is Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Meadow Miller, and we both serve as Jefferson High School's Air Force Junior RTC Group Commander and Deputy Group Commander. We are thrilled to serve as your MCs for this virtual celebration. Being part of ROTC has impacted me in several ways. Being a part of something bigger than yourself is truly an amazing experience, and I'm so honored to be a part of this program today. Agreed, Chloe. Ever since joining RTC, I've learned what it truly it means to be a leader, how to help the community around you, and I've made many friends. Today, we will salute and honor the many women right here in our local community and within our school buildings who continue to make impacts in the area of military service. That's right, Chloe. For the next few minutes, we will hear inspiring stories that recognize and affirm the contributions of women and highlight some hometown heroes. Courage, bravery, fortitude, determination. Our first keynote speaker is retired United States Air Force Laura Fogelsong. Colonel Laura M.G. Fogelsong, United States Air Force retired, graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1991. She was the first young lady selected for the United States Air Force Academy's Wings of Blue demonstration parachute team. After more than 360 military freefall parachute jumps, she graduated and served over 26 years on active duty. Selected as the first female inspection team chief, she led nuclear inspection teams into Russia under the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty until the treaty expired in 2009. She served and deployed around the world, including in Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Italy, Germany, Turkey, Korea, Japan, and Russia. She retired after serving as the Director of Military Partnerships and the United States Air Force Senior Service Advisor for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Married for 27 years to Colonel David H. Fogelsong, United States Air Force retired of Morgantown, West Virginia, they are extremely proud of their children, Robert Norman, David Andrew, and Faith Elizabeth. Retired Colonel Laurel Fogelsong, welcome. Thank you very much, Cadet Munslow. Excellent job. Very generous introduction. Um, I'm not sure about inspiring stories, but you did a great job in your introduction. Um, another shout out I'd like to give is to the Women's History Month Celebration Planning Committee, Tanya, Kara, Heidi, Connie, Laura, and Anna. Um, Everything's going on right now before spring break, and you took the time to put this together, the extensive logistics, the communications required, and I really appreciate it because we need inclusive events like this to help us learn from each other. And I'm actually really excited to hear uh, Ms. Johnson's remarks. She's got some great slides coming up, so I'm going to give my time, some of my time to her, but, and Ms. Assam as well. So I, I'm, I'm excited to hear them, and I'm glad that they're all here with us, and that's thanks to the Women's History Month Planning Committee. So thank you for setting this up. Um, and there's one other entity I want to thank, and that's actually everybody that works in Jefferson County Schools. Uh, the board, the school administration, teachers, faculty, nurses, healthcare, uh, janitorial, all the extended staff, because unlike most of the states around us, they fought to keep our schools open. And that's really been significant for our students, uh, providing sports, the opportunity to do events, um, National Honor Society having um, um, community involvement. Um, that's been extremely meaningful. Um, one of my additional duties is to be a liaison for the Air Force Academy. And so I help a lot of people put together applications for schools. And it helped West Virginia students immensely to be able to say they were involved in their community. They figured out how to safely function in our new, new reality. And that was all because of the stuff Jefferson County Schools offered them and gave them choices. So thank you for making all that possible and for supporting our students. Can ask for more of that. Um, so <laughs> inspiring story, okay. I know that when I was young, my dad tried to give me lots of advice and I didn't necessarily listen maybe as well as I should. So I will offer a couple of things that um, if I could tell my younger self, um, hopefully this time my, my dad would say, hear me now, believe me later. So what I'm saying is <laughs> you may not believe me now, but you will. There are three things that really stood out to me um, when I thought about what can I do to help other people um, you know, along a path that might be inspiring for them. So the first one, kind of obvious, but it, it's be yourself. Um, too often, 
and this is kind of a sexist statement, but ladies get in an environment and they feel like they have to be like the guys in the environment they're in. And I say, be true to yourself. Um, there's plenty of times where I was thrown into places where uh, I was not like the others and um, I wasn't going to become like the others. Um, one example was as an inspection team chief in Russia, um, they drink a lot and are very good at it. Um, <laughs> don't, you know, <laughs> inspection teams can get into a lot of trouble when you try to replicate that attitude and that behavior when you don't have the ability or, or desire, frankly, to do that. So be true to yourself and your values and um, that will help you, that authenticity will help you get further and, and accomplish more than trying to be someone you're not. So be authentic and be yourself. It's gonna be important for you, I promise. The second one is a little harder. Um, so first one, be yourself. Second one is a little harder for most people. And when you get this skill down, you will really start to see your improvements improve. And that's ask for help. Nobody's perfect. Um, no one's perfect. So when everyone struggles, you may look at someone and go, oh, they don't struggle about anything. Everyone struggles. I struggle, your parents struggle, teachers struggle. Uh, that's real. <laughs> so what makes the difference though is when you're willing to reach out and say, I need help. People can't read your mind, your counselor can't read your mind, your teacher can't read your mind, your parent. Um, when you need help, ask. And that, at least in the military, is a sign of strength. When you have someone reach out and say, hey, I need help with this, um, that's when you know this person's going to make some improvements because they've recognized I want to get better. And so ask for the help and realize that when you help someone, you feel pretty good about yourself. You know, whether it's opening a door, something kind, helping someone study for a test, feel pretty good. When you're asking someone for help, you're giving them that opportunity to feel that sense of accomplishment too. Because really, it's all about a community. We're all about helping each other. And when we're able to do that more effectively, everyone benefits. So be yourself, ask for help. The third one um, is the most challenging to stick to, and that's don't ever give up. Um, one and two are, are the dreams you want to pursue and a plan to get there. But if you don't have the fortitude and the discipline and the focus to stay on that path, you're not going to get there. It's just going to stay a dream. So don't ever give up. You're never out of the fight. You're never out of the fight. You keep fighting whatever the, the struggle is, and you're going to make progress. Sometimes your plans change along, and that's fine too, but the only time you're going to be out of it is if you quit, so don't quit. And if you're about to get to that stage, go back to number two, which is ask for help. Um, I, so yes, I very much wanted to parachute jump when I went to the academy, and uh, that, was, that was really driven to do it. My father had been Army Special Forces. I had seen him jump, and it's something I wanted to do. And when, I got there, it never dawned on me that there weren't women who did it. Like it didn't even dawn on me to look at all the pictures and realize that. And so um, halfway through training, well, so everyone can go through the basic parachute training. So I'm in the basic training and um, <clears throat> I had such a great time. So what you're supposed to go out the airplane, count to 10, pull your chute. Well, um, if you go past 10 seconds, your chute automatically deploys. That's a safety mechanism. And that happened once. And so you get in trouble, you get on probation because that's not a good thing. They don't want the safety to go off unless it's an emergency situation. And they tell you, okay, if that happens again, you're not going to get to finish the program. Um, unfortunately for me, that happened twice. And um, so they said, hey, you're at your fourth jump. You have to get to five to finish. You're not going to complete. Um, but I said, I'll come back. I'll do it next week. And I was supposed to go and leave, but don't ever give up. <laughs> You know, everyone's like, this is, you know, actually when I first said, I'm coming back next week, I'll be here on Monday, I'll start again. They didn't know what to say because no one had said that before. Um, I don't think they believed me, but Monday morning I was on the bus, <laughs> I showed up and uh, that, that next week of training, because the first week is ground training before you can jump, those instructors were pretty hard on me because they felt like they didn't want me there, you know? <laughs> so that second week was, and about the third day in, uh, one of my classmates actually went to the instructors and said, I'm not sure why, but we all noticed that you're really focusing on her because they didn't understand why I was here. So I found out later that they were, you know, questioning that. And uh, they said, well, we'll see what happens. And they didn't explain. <laughs> well, I got to the end of the week and everyone figured out what happened. I completed successfully. Uh, I was first person to finish jump with nine jumps instead of the five because <laughs> I had two weeks of it. 
And uh, I was hooked at that point. I wanted to come back and be an instructor. And again, that surprised them, but don't ever give up. You know, it would have been easy to say, it doesn't fit into the mold and that's okay. Don't, you don't have to fit in the mold. Figure out a way to get where you wanna go and, and pursue that. And those are my three hopefully helpful things that I would say. Oh, actually, I've got one more quick story, inspirational story. Another story was um, in Russia, when you got off the airplane and it's your first time as an inspection team chief, the first, the protocol is the first American off the plane who approaches the Russian team chief and shakes his hand is the team chief. You know, lead, you lead up, you come out, shake his hand. Hi, glad to see you. Um, I'm here, blah, blah, And my translator translates all that. And we all kind of step aside. Well, in his paradigm, I couldn't be the team chief because there had never been a lady do this. So he assumed that I had just broken protocol. I'm being friendly. Because uh, he had seen me on other inspections as an observer, and we had chatted, so he knew I was legit, but he didn't understand that I was now a team chief. So um, he's kind of wondering why no one is presenting themselves, and we all go to customs, and we get through the customs, and we get our stuff, and then he, he finally steps up and says, okay, so who's the team chief? And of course, my, my team is aghast, because they're like, this is not a good start to an inspection <laughs> in Russia, and uh, so I have to take a step forward. They all step back, which I didn't see until later when they told me they all took a step back because they were worried how this was going to go. I stepped forward and said, hi, uh, this is me and I'm the team chief. Let's go. Well, he was humiliated. He felt like he had made a mistake and it was an honest mistake because in his military, that would never happen. And I presumed he would understand and he did not. And so he quickly did an about face, walked out of the airport and we all followed and trailed, got on the buses. He sat completely different from me. Normally the two team chiefs sit together to kind of discuss the plan for the week and what you're gonna inspect. But he could not speak to me. He was, he was upset, he was embarrassed, he, he felt humiliated. He thought I had set him up. None of this was true, but this was his paradigm. So we get to the hotel and everyone unloads and my translator comes up and says, um, I've tried to speak to them, they're not speaking. And I said, well, come with me. So we figured out which room was his. We went and pounded on his door and he opened it and he called his translator over and we said, you know, everyone makes mistakes. I, I'm, it's nothing personal. And that's when he said, you try to embarrass me. And I said, no, it wasn't my intent. I'm sorry, it was misread, but let's explain this. And you know what? Let's do this again. Let's start again. And I reintroduced myself in Russian and I said, I am the team chief and I'm here. And I think we will accomplish more together. Then if we continue on this, this path, our teams are counting on us. And that is true. We have a, I have a full team. He has a full team here. And us squabbling is not going to help anything. And he shook his head and he said, I'll see you at dinner. And he rose up to a level of professionalism. We went to dinner and it proceeded fine. But um, if I had given up and said, well, he's being rude to me. And if he had said, she's being rude to me, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. So don't give up. Ask for help. Be yourself. Those things have worked for me. Hopefully they'll help you. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm always here to help. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, Ms. Fogelsum. That was so powerful. My name is Brogan Dozier. I'm a senior at Washington High School, and I will be pursuing a degree in political or broadcast journalism with a focus in politics at WVU this fall. Pakistani activist for female education and the youngest Nobel Prize laureate, Malala Yousafzai, once said, I raise up my voice, not so I can shout, but so those without a voice can be heard. Up next to share a special presentation, here is Mrs. Connie Balikoff. Hello, my name is Connie Belukoff. I work at Blue Ridge Primary and Blue Ridge Elementary. I'm also a US military veteran. Tonight, we'd like to take some time to highlight some of the women in our school buildings and in our community who have served or are currently serving in the military. Women's History Month Virtual Celebration Symposium. Retired Colonel Laura M.G. Fogelsung, US Air Force, Specialty, Nuclear Inspection, Team Chief and Senior Service Advisor. Years of Service, 27. Local Community Member. Retired Master Chief Hospital Corpsman Barbara Moody, U.S. Navy. Specialty, Master Chief Dental Technician. Years of Service, 
28 local community member. Senior Master Sergeant Larissa D. Caldwell, U.S. Air Force, Specialty Sustainment Services, Superintendent of the 167th Airlift Wing, years of service 23 and currently active, local community member. Candy Kaiser, U.S. Army, Specialty Satellite Communications, years of service 1996 through 1998, Blue Ridge Campus. Jeremy Knight, U.S. Army, Specialty Signal Corps, years of service, 1988 through 1992, active duty 1992 through 1998 reserves, Jefferson High School and Wildwood Middle School. Janice Jeffries, U.S. Navy, Specialty, Personnel Man, years of service, from 1968 through 1971, local community member. Vicki Bubb, U.S. Marine Corps, Specialty Aircraft Maintenance, H-46 Helicopters, Years of Service, 1977 through 1980, North Jefferson Elementary School. Constance Belukov, me, U.S. Air Force, Specialty Medical Logistics, Years of service, 1980 through 1988, Blue Ridge Campus. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Lene Johnson, U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force Specialty Commander of Military Police, Officers Training and Military Intelligence. Years of service, 27, local community member. Thank you, Mrs. Belugoff. We look forward to seeing the second half of that presentation later on. Tenacity, endurance, daring, fearlessness. Our next keynote speaker is retired U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force Ms. Lene Johnson, a graduate of Bell Vernon Area High School in Bell Vernon, Pennsylvania. Lieutenant Colonel retired Lene Johnson attended Metropolitan State College, Denver, Colorado, and the University of Colorado, where she earned degrees in sociology, criminology, criminal justice, and administrative management. Her military service began in the Air Force, where she spent seven years, graduating from Officer Candidate School in 1988. Lene Johnson was commissioned as a second lieutenant military police officer. Her next assignment was Operations Desert Storm and Desert Shield, where she served as a platoon leader with the Military Police Company. Upon her return back to the United States, she was assigned as executive officer and six months later transferred to be the commander of the Military Police Company. After her tour, retired Lieutenant Colonel Lene Johnson served as the Equal Employment Manager, the Employee Assistant Program Manager, Drug and Alcohol Program Manager. After that, she would go on and complete an assignment as Commander Operations Officer for the Regional Training Institute. Completing that assignment, she held the position of Secretary of the General Staff and Operations Officer for the Joint Force Headquarters in Washington, DC. In Ms. Johnson's last assignment, she was transferred to Fort Detrick, Maryland, where she served as the Education Outreach Program Coordinator for the National Integracy Confederation for Biology Research. Her final military assignment was retirement as a Lieutenant Colonel from the United States Army. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to be here, and I'd like to thank the Department of Culture, Unity, and Equity very much for the invitation. When Ms. Tanya Dallas Lewis initially asked me if I would be one of the keynote speakers for Annual History Month, the only thing I could say was yes, especially if the topic was military women. Each March, the United States celebrates the important contributions of women to the nation, both historically and in today's society. There is so much to talk about when you give me a broad topic of women in the military. It includes for me that responsibility from the perspective of valuing diversity. Now I'm only going to address one portion of the diversity pie, specifically gender. The defense of our nation is a responsibility. It's shared. Women have served in the defense of this land in the United States for two centuries. We have contributed our talent, our skills, and our inspiration from Lexington and the Concord to the Persian Gulf and beyond. 
I would be remiss if I didn't start this discussion off with a history lesson. Let me share with you a little history about the women who have blazed the trail for you. I'm going to be short and hit some of the highlights of the contributions of the women from then and bring us to present day. You are the future. You will stand on the shoulders of these women who have made changes in America. The American Revolutionary War, 1775 to 1783. During the Revolutionary War, women served very traditional roles, nurses, seamstress, cooking in the camps for troop. The first notable female was Deborah Sanson. She disguised herself as a man to serve in the Continental Army. She changed her skirt for male clothing and enlisted. She was assigned as a scout, but she got wounded in a battle. And when the physician showed up, yes, you can imagine what happened. When she recovered, she was immediately discharged from the army. The Civil War, 1861 to 1865. Did you know that more than 400 women disguised themselves as men and fought in the Union and Confederate Army? The Spanish-American War, 1898 to 1901. This was an important war because it came along with the onset of the epidemic of typhoid fever. This led the army to establish a permanent nurses corps in 1901. Dr. Annette McGee was appointed as the acting assistant surgeon general. World War I. 1914 to 1918. Did you know that more than 35,000 American women served in the military during World War I? Their efforts and contributions in the Great War left a lasting legacy and inspired change across this nation. The services of these women helped propel the passage of the 19th Amendment on June 4th. Vote for women, yes. Guaranteeing women the right to vote. World War II, from 1939 to 1949, 45, I'm sorry. Did you know that women in the Air Force service pilots were the first women to fly American military aircraft? The mission of the Women's Flying Detachment was to deliver planes from the factory to military bases. They forever changed the role of women in aviation. A permanent presence, 1945 to 1954. Due to the exceptional service of these women during World War II, the Women's Armed Service Integration Act was signed into law. This bill enabled the permanent presence of women in the military. Now, did you know during the Korean War, 25,000 women Army Corps and 5,000 nurses served in the Army? Poised and professional, 1955 to 1970. The Women's Army Marches On. Women did not serve in Vietnam until nearly a decade after U.S. involvement. The Women's Army Corps' first female was assigned in Vietnam in 1962. Did you know by the end of that war, 800 Women Army Corps had served in theater? It's in Vietnam, and over 9,000 nurses served in hospitals and clinics throughout Vietnam. During this period, women were then allowed to serve in the Army National Guard. Public law was also approved 9130 to equalize promotion and retirement rules for all military officers. A time of change, 1970 to 1978 moving toward equality and the disestablishment of the Women's Army Corps. The Vietnam War 
the elimination of the draft, the rise of the feminist movement had a major impact on both the Women's Army Corps and the Army Nurses Corps. There was a renewed emphasis on parity and increased opportunity for uniformity and women in uniform and diversity. A new era, the 1980s to the 2000s. During my time in the military, roles changed and continue to change for women. Yes, women are underrepresented in the military, but times are changing and women are stepping across the line. In 2008, we saw Anna Dunaway become the first woman to reach four-star general. Lieutenant General Patricia Hoverho became the first female Surgeon General in the U.S. Army in 2011, followed by the first African-American Surgeon General in the Army in 2016. Lieutenant General retired Nigel West. Another recent accomplishment was Major General Laura Yeager. In 2019, she became the commander of the National Guard's 40th Infantry Division. She is the first woman to command a U.S. Army Infantry Division. Okay, let's talk about me. One of the main reasons why I joined the U.S. military it's because the opportunities for different career experiences, along with career progression and also financial parity. Growing up, I always wanted to be a spy. Plus, I always felt that I had a calling for public service, wanting to help people. What could I be when I grow up? What profession would allow me to do it all? The military inspired by my choice to pursue a career in the service and making an impact on people's lives in a positive way. Joining the military for me gave me a sense of identity. It was where I felt most confident at the time. I knew my stuff. I had some expectations when I joined of what I might gain and what I might learn. I imagine learning new cultures and traditions, traveling around the world, meeting people of different backgrounds and picking up new skills along the way. Okay, that did happen. I admire the stories and the imagery of the military shared experience. But one thing that stood out for me, there was always a lack predominantly of women. I hardly came across any females sharing their stories and recommendations. I longed to see someone like me. The lack of representation was discouraging and often created the feeling that perhaps this was a luxury or an experience that was not meant for women. Ventures, whether good or bad, can turn you into a storyteller. When I was a captain, ah, there were a little over a thousand people in my battalion to include officers, I was the only female commander. But being in the military will spark new and meaningful relationships with people you may not otherwise ever have met. I've seen people who have less than me, but live richer lives. I have developed less of an interest for expensive militaristic materialistic items and come to understand that there is a greater reward in investing in the experiences and creating new memories. Being in the military and wandering through places and the ability for many to find themselves, it will put a lot of things in perspective for you. It influences you to make the necessary life changes. The positive experiences outweigh the negative. I would probably be in this military still today if they haven't offered me an opportunity to go back to the desert. That was not in the plan. One year of living in the desert in Saudi Arabia was more than enough experience for me. So I completed my 23 years of military service, seven years in the Air Force, and 16 years in the Army. And here is my advice to young women starting their career in the military. Don't get me wrong. The military is an experience. It's a lifestyle that will enhance you 
and form you into a confident professional. You will learn skills that you never thought you knew you had. You will be able to run multi-million dollar organizations. You will come back to West Virginia and you will be the mayor, the county commissioner, the delegate, the senator, the CEO, the governor. You will establish your own business and have the confidence that you will succeed. The experience and the breadth of knowledge that you will obtain from being in the military, the men and women in the military will be like your family. You will make such best friends. Thankful now, there's a lot more representation of women in the military when I first joined. Less than one half of 1% of the United States population is in the military. When I joined, only 1% of that one half of 1% were women in the ranks of enlisted. During the 1980s, it moved up to 8.5. During the 2000s, it's probably 15%. Okay, let me not get carried away with statistics. Let me share my last advice for those of you selecting the military as a career. Well, not just for the military, but for life in general. Set high goals. Make a plan to achieve them. Pursue your education, education, education. Surround yourself with people who support you educationally, professionally, and personally. Don't allow any setbacks or anything that you consider a failure to limit you because nothing beats a failure but a try. Look at those experiences as valuable lessons to help you succeed for you to aspire to achieve because no one controls your career in the military, but you. Remember a couple of years back, there was a young lady named Deshauna Baker, who was the first black African-American Miss America in history. She talks about how she approaches her challenge of failure. Her history, her story is extremely inspirational if you have an opportunity to listen to it. Now that doesn't have to be your experience or your goal to wanna to be a Miss America. Just knowing that whatever it is you try to do, that whatever it is you want to do, don't let any obstacle get in your way. You set your own destiny. You provide your own path and you make your own goals. Again, thank you for the Department of Culture, Unity and Equity very much for the invitation and the opportunity to share with you. Happy spring to you all. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. And now our last keynote speaker for the evening, Audacity, Spunk, Grit, Heroic. She's a veteran of the Royal British Navy community member, Ms. Carol Ozum. Born and educated in Sheffield, England at age 17 and a half, Carol Ozum joined the Women's Royal Naval Service. She would spend four, four and a half years in communications. She would do many tours of duty in many locations in England, Admiralty London, Naval Air Stations, as well as on Gibraltar and the Mediterranean. In 1916, Carol Ozum joined the Diplomatic Wireless Service with the Foreign Office in London, England as a cipher officer and cryptologist. In 1970, she would transfer to the British Embassy in Washington doing the same work. Marrying owner Erwin Ozum, the Washington DC Piccadilly restaurant in 1972, Carol left the foreign office to stay in America, where she would become the mother of two boys, Christian Ozum and David Ozum. In 1977, Carol and Irwin bought the Bavarian Inn in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. The inn started as a small restaurant and it grew quickly, soon adding hotel rooms and a conference space. For many years, Carol ran the front of the house while Irwin manned the kitchen. As the inn grew, Carol shifted the majority of her daily concentration into hotel and conference management and group sales. The inn now managed by their sons, Christian and David Ozum, is celebrating 44 years of business and employs 130 people. Carol Ozum would proudly gain her US citizenship on June 21st, 1991 at the Martinsburg Courthouse. In 2005, Erwin, Carol, and their two sons purchased the Mimslin Inn in Luray, Virginia, and completed a three-year total restoration of the historic property that they still own today. Carol has served the community in various ways, and sought her experience and insight from sitting on the boards of businesses, auxiliary boards, cotillions, the Chamber of Commerce, 
far too many to name. In 2019, she became a hospice volunteer for veterans, performing duties honoring veterans for their service and giving military funeral ceremonial honors and thanks for their duties to their country. Currently, Carol Ozum is very active as an emeritus board member, a founder board member since 2003 with CASA of the Eastern Panhandle as a special advocate for neglected and abused children. And now, Mrs. Carol Ozum. Good evening, ladies and fellow veterans. Firstly, let me say how honored I was to be invited to join this illustrious group. But I thought initially it was a mistake and had to make sure that everyone was aware that I did in fact serve, but for another country, England. That being said, as we were all discussing, if you have served your country, we all have a common ground and share a bond unlike any other. It begets a lifetime of forever friendships and fellowships. I'm particularly proud of the two cadets I'm seeing here tonight. I started my life as a sea cadet, equivalent to ROTC at the age of 15, until I was old enough to join the Women's Royal Naval Service. I was 17 and a half years old although my actual four years of service didn't start until the 18th birthday. I trained in communications, which covered a variety of jobs, mostly working underground, or in the case of Gibraltar, actually inside the rock of Gibraltar. The work covered talking to aircraft at naval air stations in South England, talking ships into harbor in Gibraltar, or telephone switchboard operating underground in the bowels of Admiralty in London. As an aside, it was amazing how adept one gets at getting dates during these operational periods. Most of them bind, of course, and only one I remember that I wish had been. <laughs> Joining the Navy was a life like no other. It gave you everything you could wish for, but most importantly, the best technical skills for a future career that opened so many doors for me after I left the military service. First of all, you were clothed, sheltered, fed, question mark, and any sport or activity was available to you, all for free. I did circuit training, I fenced on the fleet air on team, I sailed, rode, and even had a lead in the theatrical performance. All of this was doing shift work, seven days a week, mornings, afternoons, and 12 hour night shifts. There never seemed a dull or bored moment. I obviously learned most code and ciphers as a communicator. And I remember well working underground at Admiralty in London during the Cuban crisis. I was probably around 18 years old by then. And I don't think I probably knew where Cuba was living in England at the time. But I did know that it was a very serious operation and a very tense situation whilst coding and decoding the signals. After London, I was drafted to Gibraltar for 18 months, where there were only 20 of us wrens. But it was an incredible opportunity and experience and gave a lifetime of wonderful memories. I returned to Admiralty London and then to Yeovilton Naval Air Station. In those days, we had a 10 p.m. curfew and two late passes a week until 11 p.m. I had such a good social life and with the curfew felt restricted. So when my four year contract with the Wrens was up, that was part of my decision to leave. Imagine the shock and enlightenment that on leaving the Navy, I also left my social life and had no further need to stay out past 10 p.m. But again, my Naval training opened a very locked door to me and enabled me to apply to the Diplomatic Wireless Service at the Foreign Office in London. And happily, I was accepted as a cipher officer, 
due to my qualifications gained in the Navy. All of my colleagues were mostly male, just a handful of women. Again, shift work with one or two women on each shift. All of us were ex-service personnel. I was asked about how women were treated in the workforce in those days. I'm fortunate to be able to say I never felt any different from the rest of the crew. Obviously, a few were flirtatious, but once you put them straight, you were left alone. In London, I also returned to my affiliation with the Sea Cadets and had my own unit and became an area officer. Hence, my great interest in these young people in ROTC. In 1970, I was posted to the British Embassy in Washington, DC. My colleagues found the British restaurant, which a young German fellow was running. I was invited to join them one evening and met this fellow. And that, as you say, the rest is history. After dating for nine months, we married. And because my husband was an alien and because of my high security clearance, I was forced to leave the diplomatic service and also not allowed to visit any communistic country for the next 10 years, as I had obviously signed the official secret site, sort of loose lips sink ships and all that. In 1977, we moved to Shepherdstown, West Virginia to open the Bavarian Inn. As well as working at the inn, I became involved in numerous organizations and charities. I'm particularly too proud to be involved in two special groups, Hospice of the Panhandle, where I get to meet veterans and give special certificates, thanking them for their service and giving military tribute to honor them at the end of life. The other is CASA EP, court appointed special advocates for abused and neglected children. I was a founding board member in 2003, now emeritus. I am particularly enthused by a new group being formed called Fostering Futures. This is for children aged 18 or so, aging out of the foster care system and going it alone. One thing I really would like to be known is that college isn't out for these children because of finances. The state of West Virginia will give free tuition to any foster child who would like to get a college education. This needs to be spread to our 13 year olds and upwards so they can plan for their future. And of course, there's always the military awaiting them and all other young people. Thank you all for your service and hopefully future service. And I am truly honored to be here with you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Awesome. What an inspiration. Back with the second half of our special Hometown Heroes presentation, Connie Balikov. Hello again, everyone. Now for the second half of our special um, presentation honoring our local women in military service. Following the end of this presentation, we will have words from our superintendent, Dr. Bondi Shea Gibson. After that, closing words from our Women's History Month Celebration Planning Committee. Veteran Carol Azam, Royal British Navy, Specialty Communications, Years of Service 13, Local Community Member. Janelle McDonough, U.S. Air Force, Airman First Class, Specialty Law Enforcement, Years of Service 2, Local Community Member. Tina Vians, U.S. Army, Specialty Supply, Blue Ridge Campus. Jaquetta Underwood, 
U.S. Army National Guard, North Jefferson Elementary School. Verdina Lindsay, U.S. Army. Alice Hunter, U.S. Air Force. Sharice Garrido. Michelle Anthony. Roxanne Sharp. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Balikoff. Greatly appreciate that. Um, first and foremost, any undertaking this large uh, takes an enormous amount of uh, work. And I would like to thank the committee for everything that you've done to put this together for our community. Uh, it is deeply, deeply appreciated for you giving that uh, inspiration. For those of you who have joined us from the community, um, I hope you'll share my enthusiasm for all of the wit and wisdom that we've gained from these women. Uh, Jefferson County is an amazing community. There are so many folks here who have so much to contribute. And uh, I feel very, very blessed to be here um, as someone from a military family myself, um, having lived frequently on bases and around the world, um, including three years in Okinawa. That was a very interesting experience. Uh, I appreciate uh, in a very real way the sacrifices that these individuals make. Um, so I will end. There's a great uh, G.K. Chesterton quote, which I love, and it says that uh, true soldiers fight not because they hate what is before them, they, but because they love what is behind them. So I appreciate all of those of you who've served for loving the rest of us enough to make sacrifices and to place yourselves at risk and your families every single day. So thank you so much for being here and I will turn it over to our committee. I have been blessed to be a part of this planning committee, to be a part of the audience, to hear these wonderful guest speakers speak tonight. And as Mrs. Fogelsong had said, the Women's History Month Planning Committee, we all brought our perspectives or our paradigm, it was in our paradigm to this program tonight. And what you all brought is so much more than I ever expected to learn. And as Ms. Johnson said, we are, have all surrounded ourselves with those who have helped us grow as educators. And then as Mrs. Azon said, we have a common bond not just in our countries, but in our desire for the growth of our community and our future with our students. And I thank you all for the opportunity to have come and learned from each of you guest speakers. And I'm very proud of our Jefferson County students, Meadow, Chloe, and Brogan, who helped lead and present this evening. And I will pass it on to Ms. Connie. Imagine for a moment that your whole world changes overnight. That's what it was like for me when I joined the military at 18. The military changes a person in ways they could never imagine, but it provides many opportunities. I went to many places and I met many people, people I called friends then and still do now. I still remember graduating from basic training at Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas. As I walked across the parade grounds, I felt an unmeasurable amount of pride and patriotism for my country. I knew I would give my life to protect my country and the people that live there. Thank you so much for recognizing me and my fellow service women tonight for our military service. It has been an honor. Kenny, I have to speak soon. You gotta be quiet. Buenas noches. 
I'm Heidi Griffin, English language educator and cultural ambassador at Jefferson High School. With a heart of gratitude, I am blessed to be here today with our community making history. All of these ladies have worked very hard and I'm proud of this celebration of local warrior women in honor of women all over the world, across all cultures and all of history, renowned or obscure. I would like to dedicate this moment to my mother, Sandy Fleming, for her quiet fearlessness and fortitude that fostered in me a strong foundation of perseverance, integrity, and humanity. Here's to all the brave women who forged the way before us so that we could even be here tonight. Thank you so much. A rock, a river, or a tree, okay. cradle to your breast, sitting upon your knee. A woman raised me to be, to wonderfully be a sublime reality, a rock, a river, a tree. Oh, how they comfort me because a woman made me a rock, a river, a tree. That was beautiful. Thank you, Laura. My name is Tanya and I'm the cultural unity and equity um, coordinator for the district. And I just wanna say, man, this has been such a wonderful experience, especially to be able to come together with the Women's History Month planning committee and really get to know um, ladies who are becoming like sisters. I wanna salute all the women who spoke today so courageously and so bravely. I also wanna salute our young people. <laughs> Chloe, Meadow, Meadow, Brogan, you ladies are the bomb.com. I want you guys to continue shining so brightly as you contribute back within your communities and ultimately the world. We are pushing for you. And lastly, I wanna give a shout out to Anna Haas. She's also a part of this committee, but was feeling a little bit under the weather. And so she is a uh, elementary school teacher at Ranson Elementary, and she played a very large role as well um, in us putting together this presentation to salute women right here in our community, um, to recognize them and to grant them an opportunity to impact lives like they already have. So thank you so much. And um, passing the baton to the next person. As we close, we hope you had an enjoyable time as we saluted and honored women right here in our local community in honor of women's history. We'd like to take this time to thank our keynote speakers, Laura Fogelsong, Lene Johnson, and Kara Awesome, for inspiring us with amazing stories this evening. Thank you to our honorees and to Superintendent Bonnie Shea Gibson and Major Sudam. Thank you to our parents and all of the women who have served. Thank you to the wonderful women of the Women's History Month Celebration Planning Committee and the Cultural Unity and Equity Departments of Jefferson County Schools. May everyone continue to stay safe and stay well. I am Cadet Colonel Chloe Munslow. It was my pleasure to serve as one of your MCs for this special event. And I am Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Meadow Miller. It was also my pleasure to serve as the co-mistress of ceremonies today. We hope you have a great evening after a wonderful time of saluting women's history. Thank <laughs> you. 